Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, where we explore the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello. And we have a very, very special guest joining us today. Everyone, please welcome Tanya. Hi. Welcome. (laughs) All right. It's radio. You can't see. I threw my hands up in the air. It's okay. It was implied. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Tanya, you want to just tell everyone about yourself and other shows that people can find you on? Sure. I am in the Twin Cities and I enjoy movies and theater. I have a degree in theater and am currently on a podcast called Real Education Noir, Mm. which comes out twice a month. And we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. Yay! This is a podcast series going through the filmography of Joel Schumacher. I have to ask, what is your history of the films of Joel Schumacher and your kind of overall impression of him as a director? Well, I'm sure I've seen more than I realized I've seen because I'm really bad about paying attention to who's <laughs> directing things unless I'm like watching them all like Kurosawa or, you know, mm. Hitchcock, where I'll just sit down and be like, OK, I'm going to watch everything they have ever made. Right. Is he the one that ruined the Batman franchise? <laughs> Pretty much, yep. <laughs> yes, that's pretty much what he's known for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's my general knowledge. <laughs> yeah. And other stuff, you like Lost Boys and St. Elmo's Fire and Flatliners and Clients. Well, see, those are things that I like. <laughs> he's a sneaky one like that, yeah. I yeah. know, right? He's definitely a filmmaker where you bring his name up and there is definitely that instant go-to elephant in the room. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that does kind of overshadow everything else sometimes. I shouldn't say ruined the Batman series because I I saw Batman and Robin twice in the theater. Oh, wow. Obviously, like, I have a thing for his movies. Did not ruin it for you, obviously, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I was talking to Noel about doing this episode, I was like, oh, I really love The Incredible Shrieking Woman. And he was like, really? <laughs> was it like that? Because I hadn't seen it. So, I really <laughs> Well, I remember you saying that something like that was not what you had heard. Maybe I'm rewriting history. (laughs) I don't recall on my end, so I can't say either. The world will never know. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's canon now. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyways, just getting a little bit of history on the film. We, of course, have to start with Lily Tomlin. Yay! Who really rose into prominence in the late 60s on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Mm-hmm. And it was in the early 70s, 1971 specifically, that she had also been doing a lot of stage routines where she was bringing a lot of her characters to the stage. And she was going to do an album. She was going to do a Broadway show. And that's when she saw a TV pilot written by a woman named Jane Wagner and reached out to her asking if she would help her write the album and all that stuff because Lily comes up with a lot of ideas but just doesn't really like being the one to mechanically put them all together. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted a collaborator. From that point on, the two of them are married and have been together for over 40 years. Oh my God. That's sweet. And from that point on, Jane Wagner became her primary writer for all of her albums, all of her TV specials, all of her stage shows. The two of them, to this day, I will say, I bought the DVD for Incredible Shrinking Woman months ago, Mm -hmm. and they just this month released a brand new (laughs) Blu-ray. And I'm like, oh, that's nice, but I don't really need to upgrade until I'm like, includes brand new interviews with Joel Schumacher and Lily Tomlin and Jane Baker and deleted scenes. And I'm like, oh, shit. I literally overnighted that to myself last week. Oh, wow. So you had a chance to go through it? Oh, yeah. And oh, has good, a good. lovely conversation between Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner just talking about their origins and the origins of this movie. And Are they holding hands? No, but they're still lovely and calling each other honey and all that stuff. Aww. And- Aww. 
That's adorable. <laughs> and by the way, I have to recommend if you've never seen an interview with Joel Schumacher, check them out. He is also wonderful. <laughs> Anyways, Joel and Lily and Jane actually knew each other from before. Because Tanya, you probably haven't heard this, but Joel began his life in fashion in New York, hmm. became a fashion designer in Hollywood, and then gradually started writing and directing and wrote like Sparkle and Car Wash and The Wiz and all that stuff. Wow. And he actually knew them from their time in New York because Lily and Jane were doing a Broadway show at the time he was doing fashion and the two of them just, you know, met through mutual friends. Sure. They went off in their direction. He went to L.A. and started building up his career. And because she had that famous character, Edith Ann, who was always like in an oversized rocking chair because mm -hmm. she's playing like a five-year-old, mm -hmm. Universal wanted to do a remake of The Incredible Shrinking Man. And Incredible Shrinking Man, based on a novel by Richard Matson from 1956, made into a very famous movie in 1957, of course, was famous for oversized sets as the character is constantly shrinking. So they're like, hey, she's on an oversized set. <laughs> Match made in heaven. Oh, yeah. So they got in Jane to write the script. The problem was... The problem singular? <laughs> there's more problems. <laughs> <laughs> the main problem was that Lily and Jane had just tried breaking into theatrical features in 1978 with the infamous Lily Tomlin, John Travolta romance drama <gasps> Moment by Moment. Oh, God. Which Jane wrote and directed. Wow. Um, it is not an overstatement to say it was a gilet of its time. It was uh. shredded and just everyone hated that movie. Hmm. I actually watched the first half of it last night. I, I still haven't watched the second half yet, but it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> oh, wow. So Incredible Shrinking Woman was a project they had already been developing. They had John Landis was signed on to direct. He had just done Animal House. He was uh -huh. coming off of that. Hmm. And him and Jane really sat down and hashed out a script. And it was such a big script that it budgeted out to $30 million. Oh, Jesus. Wow. For 1980. For 1978 or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah 78. Yeah, because it's a little bit earlier, right? And that was right when Moment by Moment was released. And Lily Tomlin kind of became box office poison for a year or two. Mm -hmm. And the budget was just like, we're not doing that anymore. It was slashed. They had to figure out a way to kind of bring this in on the cheap. Enter Joel Schumacher, who, you know, they were friends with. We had just covered mm -hmm. in our last episode, Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, the TV movie that he did, mm -hmm. which got him a lot of acclaim. So people in Hollywood were interested in getting him in, into the theatrical side. He knew Lily and Jane. He thought this would be a good foot in the door opportunity. He had no idea what he was taking on. <laughs> <laughs> It helped that moment by moment, all the poison of that was kind of undone by between the two movies is when nine to five came out. Sure. Okay. There's other trivia I have, but that's pretty much <laughs> everything that led us to this point. That's the story of how Incredible Shrinking Woman happened. <laughs> <laughs> Without getting into the recommends yet, Angie, is this a film that you had seen before? It's weird because I know I watched it as a little kid, and yet every time I kept trying to picture it in my head, I kept just picturing Edith Ann, like I mm -hmm. thought that was <laughs> from this movie. Stuff did flash back to me as I watched it again, but yeah, I definitely remember, I don't know if we had it on VHS or if I just caught it on TV a lot, but I definitely watched this and liked it as a kid. And Tanya? I definitely latched onto this because I'd seen Edith Ann and the operator in short bits on like Sesame Street. So mm. I was already into Lily Tomlin and I actually thought that this was a movie about Edith Ann the first time I saw it <laughs> because I was not paying attention. <laughs> it's really not. But it solidified my adorable, like I can't get enough of Lily Tomlin as a comedic actress. And me, again, this is one I know was on TV when I was a very young child. There's still a few images that I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But I have not seen it since. This has been my first time watching it in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, just to point out, the two of you are not misremembering this. Edith Ann was in this movie. The deleted scenes are on the Blu-ray. And TV cuts that played throughout the 80s had additional scenes in them, including the Edith Ann scenes. Oh, okay. 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 Good. There were more scenes involving other characters that Lily Tomlin played in other bits that were oh, scattered throughout okay. the movie, and they kind of just cut those down. Yeah, because I saw the one I watched on Amazon last night had the operator. Yep. Yeah, the operator was in the one I watched, yeah. Yep, that's the theatrical cut. But there's mm -hmm. additional scenes with even her, there's scenes with Edith Ann, there's scenes hmm. with a couple other Lily Tomlin characters that do appear in that TV version from the 80s. Sadly, I can't like find just a good solid cut of it, but if you right. watch this film,
film when you were younger in the 80s, you did see those bits. So you're not misremembering. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's well, that good. makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sadly, they only have like an Edith Ann scene on the Blu-ray. They don't have all the other cut scenes. Mm. Was there also a scene where she finds her blouse? Yes. Okay. Because I was like waiting for that and it didn't happen. And I was like, I guess that was a TV version. I'm remembering, like, she finds a teeny, teeny pink blouse. Yes, that blouse. At first, she's like, it disappeared, and then later she finds it. Oh, and it shrank. Okay. Right, like, that's the clue of what's happening to her. That might be in the TV version. That wasn't in the screenplay. I did read the screenplay, which had a lot of the cut stuff, but okay. that sound, God, that image sounds familiar. Doesn't it? I kept waiting for it, and it wasn't there. <laughs> it was, like, so weird. I'm like, Wow. <laughs> So anyways, <laughs> since we're already starting to discuss the movie. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Angie, did you want to go ahead and give us just a synopsis of the movie? Sure. Pat Kramer is a stay-at-home mom whose hands are full taking care of her rowdy children. She has a maid, Concepcion, to give her a hand, but her son Jeff is basically a monster, so it doesn't help. Her husband is an advertiser of all kinds of chemical products. He accidentally spills some of his company's new perfume on her and the next morning, the blouse she was wearing seems to have disappeared and she begins to get smaller and smaller. Her husband's company is a front for the Organization for World Management, a generic evil corporation with plans of world domination. Pat is referred to the Kleinman Institute for Tests, another company that is a front for OWM. They tell her it's all the chemicals in nearly every product she's ever used that are making her shrink, but don't worry, they'll make her an antidote. This is, of course, a lie, as all they really want to do is make a serum from her blood that will allow them to shrink anyone else in the world they want to. As Pat becomes a public oddity and appears on television, they urge her not to reveal the cause of her shrinking. Pat shrinks down to doll size, and after a failed attempt by OWM to convince her to sell life-size versions of herself, they set up an elaborate scheme to kidnap her but make Concepcion think she accidentally killed Pat with the garbage disposal. The world and her family mourn her death while she is taken to their research facility. There she befriends a sign language speaking gorilla named Sydney and an inept attendant named Rob. After revealing their world shrinking domination plan to Rob, the three of them work together to escape the lab. They end up in front of a grocery store where Pat announces to the world that she is still alive, what OWM planned to do, and that everyone should just love each other and be happy as she seems to slowly shrink down into nothingness. The leaders of OWM run into hiding, and the world mourns Pat yet again. All hope is not lost, however, as Pat did not disappear, but simply fell into yet another pile of chemicals spilled on the ground, and she comes home just in time to witness the world candlelighting ceremony for her. Everyone rejoices, including Sydney, who has come to live with her family. They will all live happily ever after, or will they? Pat seems to be getting a little larger. So, Angie, do you recommend this movie? I do. As long as you go into it realizing that this is a very silly, primarily made for kids, not going to make a whole lot of sense kind of movie, there's a lot of fun to it. It's got a lot of charm. It's got a lot of goofy, silly little moments. I liked it a lot. Tanya, do you recommend it? I do. And not just because of everything that Angela said, but it's fantastic. And the irony is not lost on me. Like it had a message and I, being the hippie liberal that I am, agree with said message. So yeah, go watch it. Yeah, I do too. I think some of the themes ended up being a little watered down from what they intended. And mm -hmm. Jane especially gets into this <laughs> on the Blu-ray. But they still made a fun movie. There's still enough there to make it interesting. And the performance is good. The effects are a lot of fun. Sydney is such a late act addition, but oh, is he charming. Oh, God. <laughs> and Joel did a really good job directing it and <laughs> brought a lot of style and energy to it that I wasn't quite expecting. And I think it's a film that it's a bit wobbly. It doesn't yeah. quite hit everything it's aiming at, but it's so fun. I don't care. And it does a lot of things really well. So Tanya, do you want to just go ahead and just expand on some of those themes in the film that you really enjoy? Sure. For one thing, it's in the early 80s. So it's right around the time of like Mr. Mom and mm. when you're starting to get into some more feminist mainstream media. So the take on she's a housewife, she feels like she's shrinking because her role in American society at the same time could be said to be shrinking. I mean, there's a lot of analogous things that you could put in there. 
There's also, like, you said that Joel Schumacher certainly came with a style to this movie. And I was just going to comment on all the costuming and the Mm -hmm. specific color choices that are so prevalent throughout the whole thing. Like, everything is almost cartoonish, Mm -hmm. but in a way that makes it more poignant to the reality of what she's going through. And I may be overanalyzing, but that's me too, so. I think the way to describe it, and not to dig up Woody Allen, because, you know, <laughs> but this reminds me of, like, a lot of the costume work that he did in Sleeper, the Woody Allen movie, mm-hmm. which Joel Schumacher was the costume designer for. It's grounded exaggeration. Mm, exactly. It's exaggerated, but it still feels grounded. Like, yes, you could walk into this house and see these people. Even on the DVD, he's like, I literally went and got a box of, you know, those really colorful cookies, and I put it up on a whiteboard in front of the costume department, and I said, now match that. (laughs) This does not surprise me. The Necco Wafers. Necco Wafers was the one he mentioned, yeah. Mm. And it's even when they're trying to make the point about, like, the chemicals are bad or, like, the falseness of marketing and advertising to adults. That's when it showed up most prevalently to me, like the very beginning when she's driving down the street Mm -hmm. and all her neighbors and friends are like outside. They're basically looking like they could be in a commercial and they're shouting, Mm -hmm. literally marketing headlines at her. And this is like a conversation to them. Like, I thought it was just really interesting. And then like she becomes doll size. So you can get into like Barbie doll house and like what that means about 50s or suburban lifestyle. And you layer all kinds of things on it. And again, I don't think this is the most poignant movie about those things. But I like that they tried it. And I like that they tried to make it palatable to somebody who isn't a hippie liberal and wanting to see that in some sort of dour drama kind of way. Mm -hmm. Angie, what do you think? Yeah, some of the color palette and stuff reminded me of the way that Tim Burton often presents suburbia. This reminds me a lot of Edward Scissorhands. Yes, absolutely. Like the pink of her cabinets Mm -hmm. in the beginning like was like so Tim Burton. I mean, like literally like Tanya was saying, when she's going down the street, it's like through a magazine or something (laughs) that she's driving through. And at first my thought was, oh, it's like, look at all these people. They're living the ideal lifestyle. She's so overwhelmed. But it's a nice, subtle way to make this commentary, but not beat you over the head with it and put it in a silly comedy, too. And I wonder, too, if this is part of what got watered down. Yes. Like if there was supposed to be more of a through line, but Mm -hmm. they went and added back in more of your pratfalls or more of your... Like when she gets the stuff dumped on her in the garbage disposal, more of the prop comedy because yeah. studio execs decided they didn't want that much of a message. Well, part yeah. of that wasn't it wasn't so much the studio execs. It was more just the budget slash. Oh, OK. Mm. And I believe what the big difference was is that in the original version, she agreed to become a spokesperson and it became this whole flurry of world tours and products and doing commercials and doing pitch tours. And even as she's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and these objects are starting to overwhelm her more and more. I could really see a film like that playing out. They just didn't have the budget to do that. So they had to more narrowly focus it on the home and the lab. Sure. Okay. That makes that opening scene make a lot more sense. Yeah. No one else worked on this script but Jane Wagner. So she was still attached to it because she was also the executive producer on this. So she was herself Mm. doing all the cuts and rewrites and all that stuff. And even she's like, yeah, I think we cut it down too much. Mm -hmm. But she still enjoys the finished film. Because that still comes across. Like, it's not like you have to hunt for it. It's still there. Exactly. It just would have been cool to just see more of the emphasis on that. Yeah. But then again, you might lose Richard Baker's amazing performance as Sydney. Yes. <laughs> Which, by the way, I was going to look and see if he ever played other. Um... This is like one of seven. Because he did Schlock with John Landis. That's how he got attached to this, where it, there was a famous gorilla. He won a special award. Yeah. And then he did the Dino De Laurentiis King Kong movies. Mm-hmm. Yep. In 76. And then he did Gorillas in the Mist. And then Mighty Joe Young in the 90s. Yes. Okay. As well as the Kentucky Fried movie. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael yeah. Jackson's Thriller. And he was a puppeteer in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, as okay. well as being in Planet of the Apes. Well, and then he did all the makeup for the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes, which I think is the best thing in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that explains a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan. He did all the grills yes. in that. But yeah, I know especially for Gorillas in the Mist, he was just praised because there were scenes where there were people in gorilla suits next to real gorillas and no one could tell who was who. Right. Mm. And I have to say, while I found the entire film amusing and charming, the two biggest laughs I had in the movie were Sydney. (laughs) 
the bit where he's standing casually by the elevator and the police ask, which way did they go? And he points. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then the bit where he opens up the elevator door, sees the guards and the lab coat technicians and flips them the bird. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought there was so much energy there. Do you think they wanted Marty Feldman to play Rob? That would make sense, but I like the guy they got. No, I like him too, but I'm just wondering if they were like, oh, we should write this for Marty Feldman. What's interesting is the character on the page is more of just a laid back stoner type. Ah, interesting. And this guy just had a lot more energy and they definitely made use. Well, I know this guy, Mark Blankfield, and the people playing all the security guards are part of a stage act. Huh. Okay. Yeah, they knew Joel in New York too. They had a whole Keystone Cops routine that they would always do on stage. And that's why he brought them in for this. Oh, nice. Yeah, because that was a really well choreographed Benny Hill in and out of doors thing. Oh, yeah. In one elevator, out the other elevator. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The physical comedy in this movie always gets me Mm because it's thought through and exact in a way that it can get sloppy in other things. Yeah. And that's where I was curious about Joel, because, you know, as we've been going up through his career, he's only directed two TV movies before this. And mm-hmm. they're very kind of simple, just kind of very grounded, shot in a very, you know, TV. You got your medium shots, your close-ups, your your wide shot and all that stuff. I was curious how he would do something zany because he had written Car Wash, so he had written zany before, but he had never right. really directed it. And I thought he really did a good job getting the energy, getting a good flow to the sequence. I agree. Yeah, it was really well executed. If you ask me, I think it's because he took more of a hands-off approach and let the people who knew what they were doing with the physical comedy do what they wanted to do. And just knew how to shoot it in a way that allowed it to just play for itself mm-hmm. and then trust your editors, too. Exactly. Right. And then also that whole montage sequence of her going through the lab tests. Yes. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. Yes. Very good. That could have been in anything from an actual sci-fi movie to a horror movie. Yeah. I thought it was really well choreographed. You know what? With scenes like that, and we're talking about, you know, the pastel costume designs and even the synth score, which I'll get to in a second. (laughs) What's fascinating is this movie almost feels like the movies that are being made today that are set in the 80s. Yes. Yeah, I can see that. It's got that exaggerated gloss to it. And even (laughs) how the score just takes on this kind of almost 8-bit sound at times. And it's so... 80s, even though this was actually made in 1979. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's like self-referential because what we think of as a 70s movie, it feels more like they're set in what actually would have been going on in closer to the late 60s. In movies, you kind of get this 10-year fallback behind in your aesthetic. But this one, it just was like, nope, we're going for two (laughs) days. I think it's also that it just so captures the moment or the period Mm -hmm. that it's in. It imbued it so well that you look back at this and it's like, this is the type of stuff that we keep throwing back to. Mm -hmm. And I did also want to definitely mention the score by (laughs) Suzanne Kiani. She's only really scored like four or five movies, but she was one of the pioneers of the synthwave electronica scene coming up through the 70s. And to this Hmm. day, she's in her 70s. She still does electronica concerts at Stockholm. Oh, wow. She's mostly a solo artist. She does albums and tours and all stuff, has been doing it since the the late 60s. But during the 70s and 80s, just to pay the bills, did a lot of scores for commercials, including producing a lot of jingles. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And it's because of her that we get Galaxy Glue. Galaxy Glue. Galaxy Glue. (laughs) Oh, my God. I want to type out of those lyrics because, oh, my God. How many layers of satire are they putting in there? (laughs) Well, if you want to hear that song more and more, get the Blu-ray, because that's the main menu loop. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, wow. I think I might shoot myself, but yes. I've heard it a few too many times, but yeah. (laughs) But her score is great because it's like there's times when it's a traditional score, and there's times when it's just so, again, like 8-bit electronica and just really something that you didn't really expect to hear at this time. Mm -hmm. And again, it feels a lot like something that people nowadays would produce as a throwback to the 80s when this was actually again cutting edge at the time noel are you mm. calling joel schumacher precognition no i just saying that <laughs> i think he was probably through his fashion connections and again you know friendships with lily Tomlinson. Yeah. he knew so many people socially who were on the edge of pop culture mm. makes sense and i think that is going to be something interesting to explore as we keep going through the 80s where you know that's like some of the top films of his career. And a large part of that is because of the people that he chose to work with and really brought out a lot of interesting, innovative stuff. Mm-hmm. And again, like that whole montage over the medical tests, those were actual scenes that were fully 
totally scripted out in, in the script. And they were just like, this is dragging on too long. Ultimately, we just want to get to the point where he has the whole table of products and he's just saying it's because of all this. How can we speed this up? Why don't we just make a music video out of it? Mm-hmm. And again, we're going to get to a point here in the 80s where Joel does actually start directing some music videos, but he had never done any before. How would you say this movie is placed in the evolution of the montage? That's a good question. Hmm. I think the 70s were a big era of montage work because, again, that's when you were able to quicken up the editing because editing technology had sped up more. But that's also where split screen, where you can literally show 20 different things happening at once, kind of swirling Mm -hmm. in and out of each other. Sure. And as we mentioned, as a writer, he has done quite a bit of montage work with especially Car Wash. Car Wash is like half that movie is a montage. (laughs) There was montages in Sparkle, too, that he wrote. That is well executed. Well, and the ones in Sparkle where he scripted full scenes and then they edited them in the montage. That's right. That's right. Car Wash, even reading the script of that, he wrote those Mm -hmm. as a montage. It's like we get quick cuts of this and this and this and this. And that's how they filmed it. I just see so much technique for a guy. This is only the third film he's directed in his first theatrically. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's because even in interviews, he says, you know, the key to a good director is to build a good crew and then just figure out how to bring out the best in all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good sign that he's capable of doing that. Yeah. And then, yeah, to get into the end of that montage, again, to go back into those themes, the whole kind of artifice of happiness, Mm -hmm. you know, not only in the design of, you know, everything is bright and colorful and cheery, even though it's kind of tacky and slapped on. And all of the products, all these chemicals that ultimately cause this event are all things that are done to taste good cheaply, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like we're just pumping chemicals into our bodies so that we can have the artifice of enjoying a good meal or enjoying a clean window or enjoying anything like that at the expense of, yeah, but this is made of some really shitty stuff. (laughs) Well, and again, you can see that in the costume. Look at Concepcion. I mean, Mm -hmm. the more that they fall into the world of fame and artifice and whatever her costume changes, the way she acts, that's a commentary on what the media does to women in a certain aspect. And then like when she thinks that she has done wrong, what she does to herself and what is Mm -hmm. considered proper for her to look because she goes back to the very prim black clothes, the very conservative hairdo. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, that goes into the whole crash and burn thing of, you know, she got her taste of fame and then it led to Mm -hmm. consequences and then she had to pull back. It's this weird little microcosm message. Yeah. Yeah. And Judith's role, too, is Mm. a very interesting role to me as far as looking at it from a feminist perspective, because she's marketing to women. She's marketing all these things that are supposed to aid women. But at the same time, all of them are just covering up the real woman that's there. So like, what does that say about all these products and all the marketing and like the artifice of it all? And I love how she takes a turn on that. Yeah. And then by the end, she realizes that actually that's not what's important, even though she still hasn't lost her values and like still squirms at any mention of sex whatsoever, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is adorable. But, yeah, no, I I love that whole turn of it. It's like, you know, she genuinely cares for her friend and neighbor. And, Mm -hmm. you know, she had this whole gig of like going around and selling all stuff. But then she sees what's happening here. And then that great scene where she's in the supermarket, everyone's gawking at Pat, but all that Judith can do is just look at all the labels on all these cartons and bottles and stuff and realize, what is all this stuff that's in here? (laughs) And again, like, and then tries to become an activist and tries to get Pat to join her on the cause. But again, that even shows that everyone is trying to use Pat and Mm -hmm, no one's listening to her. And as she becomes smaller and smaller, her voice becomes smaller and smaller. Yeah. Well, I think, too, it's nice to have the contrast in Lily Tomlin herself playing both characters. Yeah. Because you Mm -hmm. can see her as more of the realistic mom at the beginning, but you know she's Judith, too. So there's, for me, an interesting viewing of the movie in watching the different layers of the woman that is Lily Tomlin and how she's expressing that through her arts Mm -hmm. and what that says about the movie. And knowing that it was written by her partner and they were working on it for a really long time together. That's really interesting to me. And that's what's interesting is because this script, again, was supposed to be kind of like the Eddie Murphy movies of like, let's just have a whole bunch of characters played by Lily Tomlin. Mm. And they ended up cutting out almost all of them. But what I liked about Judith Beasley is that she wasn't just a bit that they were going to do. Like a lot of the characters, even in the script, were just bits. It would be like Edith Ann shows up for a quick bit. 
Judith Beasley is a fully developed character and actually quite an essential character in the story. And it was interesting seeing them still pulling off the fact that they're both played by the same person. Mm -hmm. As far as Judith is concerned, I imagine it was a way for Lily Tomlin to be around more of the actors more Mm. frequently. Because I'm sure once she started shrinking... Oh yeah, because she's on the shrunken sets. Yeah, she had to be on the sets. I'm sure she had someone to interact with, but she was doing a lot of that alone. So I imagine Judith was a good way for her to be with everybody and still get to be a part of the filming. (laughs) No, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, and it shows off her talent wonderfully. That she has that range. Because I know people who have seen the movie on, on first viewing did not realize that that was also Lily Tomlin. Because it wasn't one of her more obvious character characters. Well, and Judith Beasley is one of her characters from Laughing. Mm-hmm. She was the nosy next door neighbor, basically. Yeah. But again, that they still flesh her out. She has a full arc and story. And also that she's playing off Pat, which is a very mm-hmm. grounded character and not typically what you would get from Lily. Mm-hmm. Right. It was an interesting choice. And I thought you do start to forget as you're watching the movie that it's the same actress playing both roles as you just get into both his characters. Yeah. So what do y'all think about Charles Grodin as the husband? <laughs> He's mm. creepy. <laughs> but that's just because he's really Charles I really kept Broden. expecting him to cheat on her, honestly. <laughs> Which I guess isn't very fair, but... Like with Concepcion? <laughs> well, I don't know. Or like, I guess because it was like the whole thing. They're like, oh, airport gifts. Like I was expecting him to have a secret person on the side or... Yeah. Especially because, you know, he's reading the Marriage Without Sex book. Yep. And-, <laughs> and then nothing will change between us until this ring is off your finger. And then... Right. <laughs> and then it falls off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two things about him. One, it was nice to see Charles Grodin in a role that's not typically Charles Grodin because he's always so mm. acerbic and sarcastic and just deadpan and all of this stuff. Yeah. It's kind of nice to see him just as like the typical sitcom husband from the 50s. Mm-hmm. And what I liked is that even though he's kind of a vapid dimwit, <laughs> that he is fully immersed in this commercial culture to the point where he is the commercial man. He is the ad man. He, he sells the products. Mm. He's bringing home samples. And yet he's still trying. He still loves his wife and he's still trying to figure out how to make it work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's not doing a very good job of it. And I think part of that is also, the again, some stuff that was cut. But he's trying to accept that this is happening and is trying to be there for even though he's not very good at it. How do you guys feel about reading the script as a metaphor for terminal illness? Like as far as Pat's concerned. Hmm. Well, and that's one of the whole metaphors of the original Incredible Shrinking Man to begin with. So yeah, I mean, that definitely makes sense. Okay, yeah. Because I found dealing with my parents aging and stuff and watching their relationship and some of the choices that they have to make in their relationship because of both of their health issues. You know, watching him struggle with how do I deal with being in a marriage where a person I can't interact with in all the ways I want to. And like, I have to admit the death scene, I actually cried. Yeah. Like when they're burying the shoe. I was surprised that it hit me that hard because as a kid, I was just like, oh, look at the little shoe. That's so cute. You know, but now I'm looking at him like going, oh, my God, I'm crying. And I didn't expect that. Despite, you know, their struggles and he doesn't always understand. And when she dies, it hits him and he is so mourning of it. And he's with his children. And then when he finds out she's alive again, he's like pleading for, please, if you have any information about her. And then even when they see her die again, you know, Mm -hmm. he genuinely loves his wife. Yes. Yes. And that's what I love is that there's genuine love between them. In the script, part of Concepcion's change is that as he becomes less capable of having a sexual relationship with Pat and is, you know, reading Mm -hmm. the book and is going through his frustrations and all stuff, Concepcion is trying to seduce him. She sees him as now being available. Sure. Okay. Well, and that's the thing that Lily Tomlin is worried about. I mean, when Concepcion chucks the kids into bed. Being replaced. Yeah. And looking at that as a divorced woman whose ex is getting remarried, that struck me. Like, this is a thing that doesn't get talked about in mainstream media, but it's there. It was interesting to see that reflected so clearly. Yeah. What was interesting is even in the script, he never is lured in by it. And even here, it's like, you know, she's dressing up in the slinky outfits and all stuff, (laughs) but he doesn't even notice. He's still always focused on his wife and the kids and work and all that stuff. And she's just always Concepcion the maid to him. Mm -hmm, And to mm -hmm. be fair, Concepcion is not the best character. No, no. No, There were some problems there, but that's okay. Yeah. But I do, again, still like how it's, this is an opportunity that's now been made available to him should he choose it, but he doesn't want to choose it. He loves his wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also, again, that when Concepcion thinks that she kills Pat, it hits her and she has consequences and goes through an emotional arc over it, too. Yeah. There's a lot more to this script if you actually really sit down and look at it. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And then you're know, getting into the whole sinister secret underworld. <laughs> <laughs> the conspiracy theory in me loves this part. So yeah, the whole conspiracy, we're going to shrink the world so that we don't have to worry about diminishing resources because we need to use less of them. Except for, you know, us few ruling class. But did they even really say that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not blatantly, but... The script was a little more clear about that, but it's still in there. Okay. Coincidentally, did you guys see the most recent trailer for that Matt Damon movie? Yeah. Yeah, downsizing. Yes. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, somebody is doing the incredible shrinking woman, but from a different <laughs> perspective. Yeah. Building off of what's basically been set up here. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I was like, holy crap, somebody's doing it as, like I was talking about before, not as a comedy but as let's seriously sit here and look at this as a concept and find the horrors and the benefits mm -hmm. and i was like wow good timing podcast yeah <laughs> and again it's like you know we just slip it into the drinking water like fluoride and suddenly the entire population is tiny we roll over them and they don't use up all of our resources so we have more for ourselves i can still believe people would do that <laughs> <laughs> For me, yeah, it's such a wild concept, but it's played so well in the boardroom. And John Glover in a surprisingly toned down performance for John Glover. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. He's usually all out there, and we're going to see him all out there when he comes up in Batman and Robin. Right. John Glover, he was the voice of the Riddler on Batman the Animated Series. So every time I hear him speak a line in a movie, I'm like, the Riddler's here. And then I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, he does tons of stuff. John Glover's great. Okay. <laughs> so were we supposed to know that Henry Gibson was evil the moment we saw him? No. No. Okay. That was a surprise when they came back. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, because I thought they were only going to be in that introductory scene. And Dr. Ruth Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I love the way she so carefully plays her villains mm. Mm -hmm. because she gives them arch without needing to do almost anything. Right. And that's such a hard place to live. Mm -hmm. So I loved Henry Gibson and Elizabeth Wilson doing that, especially when they're in a scene with Ned Beatty, <laughs> who's just being his goofy self. Like, <laughs> Ned Beatty's Ned Beatty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What I loved about the lab sequences was how they just diminish Pat as a human. Mm -hmm. They just mm -hmm. literally treat her like an animal in a cage. And it's like, if you don't stop talking, we're going to try. Yeah, just the mere act of talking, we're going to tranquilize you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we don't even want to hear your voice. And it's, again, playing in the feminist themes, how she's been so diminished and silenced. Mm -hmm. And even just telling the hapless Rob that that's not really her. That's just a clone that we made. She's just a thing. Yep. Yeah. Again, I like that she gradually forms that bond with Sydney and with Rob. And it's like <laughs> Sydney comes into this movie so late in the movie, like only in the last 20 minutes, and yet he's such a part of it. So mm -hmm. whatever happens to Rob? Like, is he just arrested now? He was in a bar at the end. He Jean. was? Yeah, on TV. Okay. Like, they were throwing stuff on the news about her death, and he's in there looking sad. I okay. And part of that is stuff that was cut, because the thing is, okay, so he still had that page from the folder that had the whole evil plan. Yeah, right. he was supposed right. to distribute it to the news mm -hmm. media or whatever. In the script, when she's disappearing and is, like, telling, and Rob, make sure you get page 10 out there, he's looking around and realizes he dropped it in the crowd. <gasps> Jeez. And then Lily had this character throughout the script of this zany bag lady who was like shouting conspiracy theories outside the supermarket. <laughs> and of course, the film ends with her finding the page and reading it out loud to everyone and mm. everyone thinking it's more of her conspiracy theories. Oh. So basically, the corporation still kind of got away with it. Okay. For now. Huh. Here's my question. Had this been more of a hit, to be fair, it didn't do badly, but mm -hmm. could you have seen a sequel to this that spun on Attack of the 50-Foot Woman? Yes, I definitely yeah. think they were aiming for a se for the opportunity because of their box office. I don't think they were ever going to get it. Right. And I think the studio had already made that decision after seeing however much of the film the studio had seen. Otherwise, I think they would have done more with that last tag about her shoe. But yeah, no, I think they were angling for it and I would have watched it. Yeah, and it kind of makes mm -hmm. me think of the Daryl Hannah one that Christopher Guest made where it was a bit more of a tongue-in-cheek satire. And mm -hmm. yeah. I could so easily see that plot being redone here. Let me just check real quick. Was that something that was even a universal film that they could have? Oh, it was Allied Artists. Well, all these rights have now since converged in different areas. That's true. That's true. Aren't they all owned by Disney now? <laughs> Close enough. Practically. Half are owned by Disney, half are owned by DreamWorks. <laughs> At some point, there will be a contest of champions. Mm -hmm. They're going to have the properties tournament to settle it all. <laughs> 
anything else that leaps to mind that we haven't discussed yet? Watch more Lily Tomlin movies. Yeah. <laughs> not moment by moment. No, not that one. But nine to five. Oh, my God. One oh, of my yeah. favorites. I was surprised to look at her credits. She has only really sporadically done movies because she does put a lot more focus on her stage shows. Oh, yeah. And she's still doing them. Yeah. And that's, oh, God, I have such respect because she'll like pull off on projects that she really likes and really thinks can do something. Mm -hmm. So with the stuff that she's doing, there's always a point, like even with big business. I love big business. Yeah, it is so sort of out of the wacky 80s. We've got twins thing. And that's such a stereotype of comedy. But like, I don't know, just watch more Lily Tomlin. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm glad that we have Grace and Frankie. Yes. I love oh, Grace God. and Frankie. Yay! Even looking at this, she didn't have another movie until 1984. And then Big Business hmm. wasn't until 1988. So it's like four years between one movie and then four years till another movie. Mm. And then throughout the 90s, a lot of her roles were just supporting roles. Yeah, because she was seen as an 80s character actress. Right. Mm. Or an 80s comedy actress. She can do straight roles. She just either doesn't want to or doesn't get offered them because she's got such a name as a comedian. Exactly. And I do recommend, I went and I looked up some of the old variety show, because a lot of the variety shows that her and Jane did throughout the 70s, they weren't the one woman comedy shows that she does on stage. They were sketch comedy. And they had a lot of the characters, but there's two segments in particular that were great. One is Dull City, where it's a town entirely full of accountants, except for this one woman who was born a clown. (laughs) Again, knowing that it was done at the time it was by two women who are open lesbians, it gets into conversion therapy. Yeah. Okay. And everyone trying to force her to not be a clown. And it's a really sad short, Hmm. but it's also really hopeful. It has a good ending, but it has this really sad angle to it. And then also there's this other sketch that she did with Richard. I don't remember the name of it, but there's a sketch that she did with Richard Pryor where there's not a laugh in the entire thing. It is just this really downbeaten drug addict at a counter in a diner and she's the waitress. That sounds familiar. It's a really, really just biting, sad human character piece and wonderfully done. I think I've seen that. Lily is a genuine talent. And what's great looking at her comedy is there was a very nice subversion to it. There's a lot of sadness, Mm -hmm. a lot of the darker side of humanity, but there's also still a lot of hope within that. And I think Angie, I think that she can click well with Joel because as we've established, Joel has a very bittersweet streak to him where he can get very dark and he can also get very sweet. And most of his films are this kind of through line. And even this film, there's a lot of sadness. Mm -hmm. And even just moments where she realizes her kids aren't listening to her. She can't connect with her husband anymore. You know, all that stuff. I wonder if that's why he gets regarded as such an inconsistent filmmaker is because it's a really hard line to walk. Right. One that I think has been done sure. so rarely. I mean, you can talk about people like Billy Wilder, mm. but Billy Wilder had the script writing behind it that he could rely on, whereas Joel Schumacher didn't have the same skills. So walking that line. Yeah, he did, actually. <laughs> oh, did he? My bad. Sorry. No, well, he came up as a screenwriter first, and that's when he wrote Sparkle and Car Wash and Wiz. And having read those, I was really surprised at how good they were. (laughs) I mean, I'm not saying he's Billy Wilder. No. (laughs) But they were really good scripts. That's because Billy Wilder can only be Billy Wilder. But I mean, being Billy Wilder and trying to live in that space where you can do the heart-wrenching, poignant comedy is not easy at all. Mm -hmm. And so for what he has done, I have not given him enough credit as a director. Yeah. And that's where I'm going to be very curious getting into more of the work in the 80s here where he does step back as a writer. I think Mm -hmm. we have like DC Cab and St. Elmo's Fire, both of which he wrote. And then from then on, he would find scripts that he just really grew fond of and attached to and just started picking his projects like that. Yeah. From St. Elmo's Fire on, I don't think he writes again until Flawless in 1998. Wow. And then Phantom of the Opera. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Again, this is a film where it was surprising seeing that range of tones where it's not just silly. It's not just fighting. It's not just romantic. I prefer films that cover a range of tones and emotions. I don't really like films when they just have a singular feel from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. It's sad at times. It's happy at times. It's hilarious at times. It's evil and sinister at times. And and then we get Rick Baker as as a gorilla literally throwing a bucket of banana peels in front of him. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And then telling them they went that away. I wanted to talk about two scenes. One, just at the birthday party, when she ends up in the closet with all of those oh, wind-up yeah. toys. Yes. 
That was so freaky. And by the way, that was not in the script. That was a Joel scene. That was so hard to watch. (laughs) I was like, how did this not give me nightmares as a kid? My goodness. It might have when I was a kid because I saw that and I'm like, oh, there's something about this that feels familiar. Dude, that robot, (laughs) like, it wraps its arms around him. It's time to play. Yeah. Like, uh, the, the rabbit and the the rabbit drummer oh and the baby doll the betsy wetsy baby doll everything oh man they were creepy that was terrifying it really was it got purely nightmarish oh god <laughs> yes yeah. absolutely but i think it was good because i think it was very effective in like if you it fell was. into your kid's room in a chaotic moment and just ran into all these toys that you can't control well it right. reminded me of the scene with the super glue in the laundry mm. <laughs> there's a lot of moments where it's just this stuff happens and you're helpless against the wash of things that you have no control over for that to be in a comedy and come through so clearly i don't think that happens a lot yeah i mean honestly the entire film is just her being helpless against situations that she's thrown into right until she escapes from the lab I mean, even when she escapes from the garbage disposal, which was in itself a horrific sequence. Yeah, that was the other one I was going to bring up. The moment it started, I was like, oh my God, like the whole thing came back to me of watching it as a kid and being so afraid for her. And the giant egg yolk Mm -hmm. and just the way she almost pure desperation just pulls herself out of that. I know what was funny on the Blu-ray, Lily and Jane hadn't watched the movie in years. And she's like, I didn't remember having that much upper arm strength. (laughs) (laughs) And that even then, though, she's still just captured and thrown in a hamster cage. Mm -hmm. It's a character that to a degree lacks agency, but that's part of the point. Exactly. Yeah. She's just part of a community and a society that just ultimately doesn't really care about her, even though they want Mm. to find ways to use her to sell more things to themselves. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting theme. There's a Mm -hmm. lot going on in this movie. Oh, yeah. And I'll be honest, reading the script, I didn't really enjoy it that much. There's almost too much going on. It's unfocused and all that stuff. Mm. And then I watched the film and they pretty much shot the script. I mean, there's bits that they cut out, but they really found the emotional core to it. They Mm -hmm. really brought a lot of strength to scenes that didn't really have much impact on the page. And again, just the visuals in the film, Mm -hmm. just the way they Mm -hmm. emphasized all the themes and everything. Yeah. Amazing job to the prop department for like Mm -hmm. going through and figuring out, well, what looks like yogurt? What looks like an egg yolk? Don't forget the people behind the scenes. Oh, absolutely. And even her costuming, too, because she had to have like eight different sweatsuits that said that doll name on them. Because they were still incrementally making them bigger by shot. Right. I mean, I think one of the most impressive sequences of that scale change is the bit where she falls asleep on the doll's lap. Yes. And wakes Mm -hmm. up and suddenly she's like a tiny little, it's this doll towering over her. She's lost in the folds of fabric. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, it'd be interesting to go back again and look at when she shrinks. Try Mm. and see if there's a coincidental, like, she has a moment of agency, then she shrinks. Mm. Because the doll thing happens right after she tries to go and Mm. fix her marriage. She tries to go back. That would actually be an intro, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where it's like every time she tries to make a decision for herself, she's punished for it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but that was one that particularly struck me in that scene with the doll. Sure. I guess say one thing i did notice trivia wise is bruce logan who was the cinematographer and special effects supervisor of the movie and it's interesting that they got the same guy covering both for a movie like this the year after this he did tron oh nice Hmm. okay sure one of my only criticisms about the movie and this is more just a stylistic thing of the 70s and 80s is i'm not a big fan of films that are shot entirely with soft focus lenses yeah uh yeah sure sure imagine what those sets would be like had they had more of a crisp pop to them but Mm -hmm. it is what it is I know people who have to remaster films for Blu-ray hate soft focus. I'm movies. sure they do. <laughs> With modern TVs, that does yeah. not look too good anymore. Yeah. No. And to be fair, Tron, one of my major problems with Tron is he shot a lot of that with soft focus lenses. And it's like, that's not a film that you want to have blurry. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, one other fun little trivia bit. Listeners of the show might know, I just spent the last four years doing Masters of Carpentry where we went through all of John Carpenter. Gary Kibbe, who was John Carpenter's cinematographer from 1988 to 2001, was a cameraman on this movie. Oh, okay. Huh. Okay. I just happened at a coincidence to watch Honey, I Shrunk the Kids mm. not that long ago. 
watching that as an adult now, I kind of realized, you know, a lot of this isn't so much about story as it is, let's see how cool it would be to shrink them down and put them on these fun sets. And I feel like this movie, by comparison, the sets all have a purpose, you know, Mm. of what she's trying to do. And it's a much better use of that little person on giant set concept. I love the bit when she's still trying to prepare a meal in the kitchen. Yes. Oh, and she's yes. got the giant platform shoes and is climbing mm-hmm. on the counter and everything just falls over. I need those shoes. Yeah. <laughs> well, even more than that was the one where she was pulling the bacon onto the griddle. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it starts smoking. Yeah. I even like that one better than the salad and the spaghetti. Mm. Mm-hmm. The one bit I thought was a little forced was the way her husband kept pouring champagne on her at the dinner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was funny. (laughs) But I like that she's so hammered that she thinks it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. He did it again. (laughs) (laughs) Even just the curtain with the little knit balls that Mm -hmm. she's trying to climb. There's just Mm -hmm. so many little... What's surprising is they didn't do as much with like the oversized sets and props as I thought they would. But what they did with it was strong and stood out. Effective, yeah. Well, and I wonder if they were planning a bigger budget for it. They had to really make deliberate choices on what they were going to use with the oversized thing and how they were going to use that both to tell the story and to save on their overhead. Right. If the original plan was to, she actually agrees to become a spokeswoman and it becomes a whole series of her going through advertising and products and all this stuff as she's gradually becoming smaller and smaller against them. That's like a field day for production design. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I think I've pretty much covered everything I had to say about the film. Anything else you had to add, Tanya? No, I think I'm good. Angie? I'm good. All right. So the film was released on January 30th, 1981. And again, sadly, Box Office Mojo only begins in 1982, so I can't really (laughs) tell everything. And, And what's interesting is looking at the time of year this came out, there's not really much. The only real thing it was up against in January was Blood Beach. (laughs) because we had the tail end of the birth of the slasher movement Mm. sorry i've seen blood beach (laughs) and then by the following month it was up against ralph bakshi's american pop Mm. and i think this one probably did better at the box office the sigourney weaver thriller eyewitness Mm -hmm. and that's it because i mean like postman rings twice came out in march nothing came out in april except caveman starring ringo (laughs) Man, this was a shitty year for movies. I'm just looking at like the whole list here. It's literally slasher (laughs) movies and terrible comedies. Cheech and Chong's Nice Dreams. (laughs) Hey, they got Clash of the Titans in June. I must say Raiders of the Lost Ark came out in 81, right? Yep, Raiders of the Lost Ark was the top film of the year on Golden Pond and Superman 2. So there wasn't much else up against it. And let's see, what was the... um, I can't find what the actual budget for the film was. I believe it was around $10 million and it pulled ultimately $20 million at the box office. Well, that's respectable for yeah. the 81 season. And as we know, it got TV play in the 80s. Yes. Yeah, that's why I know it. I would be very curious to see that cut, knowing that there's a whole lot. Of... What's interesting is there's so many films from the 80s where the TV cut went and throw back in a bunch of deleted scenes just to make yeah. up the running time. Or to replace, because like yeah. they couldn't say the opening with the woman who's saying it tastes like shit. Oh, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd have to cut Sydney slipping off the cops. You know, they did that so they'd have family friendly to put back over. By the way, Angie, did you recognize that woman? She did look familiar. She was the one from Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill who sung all the big show tunes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was Pat Ast, the Andy Warhol actress. Okay. And then just to get into the original books here, it was just originally titled The Shrinking Man, released in 1956 Mm -hmm. by Richard Matheson. Now, either are you familiar with Richard Matheson? Yes. No. I really like I Am Legend, and I think I've read some of his short stories as well, yeah. Yeah, he wrote I Am Legend, Legend of Hell House, What Dreams May Come, Oh, Duel. Okay, I didn't know his name. Yeah, he <laughs> wrote most of those Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe movies starring Vincent Price. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. And he was the second most prominent Twilight Zone writer. Mm-hmm. Okay. He wrote that there's something on a wing episode. Oh. And did many, many, many others. He was literally second to Rod Serling in terms of writing the most episodes of Twilight Zone. And he also wrote for Star Trek. He was an incredibly prolific Mm. writer, wrote TV, novels, short stories, movies. Very influential on a lot of other writers that came after him. Yeah, I mean, especially like I Am Legend and stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. I know he's like a god to Stephen King who came up under him too. Yeah. Yeah. Like a stir of echoes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He wrote the original novel. 
Now, interesting connections between them is in the original book and movie, the reason why he's shrinking is just because of random exposure to common chemicals that ended up mixing in his system. Hmm, Okay. So this film is building very much on what the original established, but just taking it off in a whole other direction. (laughs) And the scene where they're in the car and they're worried about their marriage and it's like, you know what, as long as you still got that ring on, you're my husband and the ring falls off. That is directly from the original. Uh Now, the original book is a bit weird. I kind of recommend it and I kind of (laughs) don't. Well, the thing is, a big part of both the book and movie are when he's two inches tall and he's been lost in the basement and his wife basically thinks he's dead. She thinks he's Mm -hmm. been eaten. She doesn't know he's down there and he's stuck down there for weeks, still gradually shrinking just in this massive wasteland of dusty concrete with these monuments off to the side of there's your old sprinkler hose, there's your lawn deck chair and all that stuff. And he's just trying to figure out how to live with what bits of water he can find, what bits of crackers and bread have been left down there. And he's constantly being hounded by this spider Hmm. Hmm. that as he gets smaller and smaller, he becomes more of a tasty morsel, too. Hmm. And the novel, surprisingly, that's two thirds of the novel. Wow. The novel actually opens with him in the basement being chased by the spider. It's spread throughout the entire novel. And then we just flash back to these bits Hmm. of his life before as he gradually started shrinking. The problem with the novel is that the lead character is a real asshole. Oh. And the themes of the novel are emasculation, impotence, male insecurity, which, you know, all valid things to explore. Logical things, yeah, to think about, right? Yeah, and it's about this guy who, you know, starts to feel overwhelmed by a wife who's now larger than him and makes him feel like a little boy. You know, he has Mm -hmm. a child who no longer respects his authority. People at Mm -hmm. work no longer look up to him because he's no longer tall, you know, and it has this really dark edge to it where it's like, there's the chapter where he ends up getting picked up by a pedophile. Mm. There's the chapter where he ends up almost getting raped by teenagers in in an alley. Mm. There's a very sexual angle to the entire book to the point where it's like, he can no longer care for their kids. So they bring in a nanny and basically lock him up in the attic every day. And he just finds ways to start spying on and lusting after the nanny because he can't connect to his wife because he feels insecure (laughs) around her because Mm. she's bigger than him. And the thing is, the wife is trying, and she's like Charles Grodin in the movie, she's trying, but all this guy does is lash out and just shouts and screams and just vents all of his frustration on her. And it's like, I get that because, yes, it's very much a metaphor for being hit with a debilitating, gradually worsening disease. Mm. And you're no longer able to live the life that you've built for yourself. And that is going to bring with it a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness and a lot of resentment. But, you know, it's important to also have those scenes in between that where there's still connection. Mm -hmm. The book doesn't have that. Mm. Does he ever kind of redeem himself or have an awakening to his (laughs) problems? Well, yeah, when he shrunk and decides I'm finally going to go kill the spider that allows him to reassert his masculinity. Mm. (laughs) And the book ends with he's still shrinking and realizes that as he's still shrinking, it's basically he's going to hit like side microscopic Mm -hmm. levels and just whole new worlds are going to open up to him. Okay. And that's the problem with the book. Now, thankfully for the movie, the 1957 movie, it's directed by Jack Arnold, who did Creature from the Black Lagoon. Mm. And I think that was a reference in the Shrinking Woman movie when they did that. Oh, sure. Very good director. He did a lot of the big 50s sci-fi movies. It came from outer space, Tarantula. Actually, one of the better directors of those from the time. He then went on into TV, did a lot of sci-fi TV up through the 60s and 70s. It's one of those kind of just basic names that no one really paid much attention to, but always did good quality work. Mm. And Richard Matheson also wrote the screenplay But what's nice is he took the opportunity to rewrite it. Oh, good. Good. (laughs) The whole being shrunk down and trapped in the basement is basically the last half hour. Okay. What that has forced him to do is to take all the bits of as he's shrinking down to expand it. The problem with the wife in the book is she's not really a character. Mm. She's just kind of a person that he yells at and we never really hear anything from her point of view. And in this one, we get a lot of those genuine connection moments. It's where they actually sit down and talk through what they're going through. We hear from her perspective and Mm. the issues that she's dealing with. They cut out the daughter. They don't have a kid in the movie. It's just the two of them. Mm. It suddenly becomes a lot more touching and relatable. It's not just anger and bitterness. Okay. It becomes more, again, this family going through this disease because it's not just affecting him. It's affecting her too. 
And it really does a good job of doing that. It really does a good job of exploring their hopes that they can finally overcome it. But as that hope is just growing farther and further away, just that kind of hopelessness. And it's kind of all settled when he's attacked by the family cat. Okay. She thinks he's killed and eaten by the cat, but he just got knocked into the basement. And the film never really resolves that. She's just left believing that her husband died. Hmm. We even see like friends and family coming to console her and comfort her and gradually take her out of that house and try to get her out a comfortable place. But again, that means he has no hope of ever escaping the basement. Even there's bits when the basement floods and they come downstairs, he's so small they literally can't even hear his voice anymore. Mm. Mm. It's a pretty dark ending for a movie of that time period. It is, but again, it ends with him finally getting small enough that he can just literally walk out of the basement because he can fit Mm. between the cracks. And as he's now outside, he's too small for the predators to notice. Okay. And he realizes that as he's getting smaller, you know, he again gets to the whole thing of he's now going to see sights that no human has ever seen before. It's another poignant part of it being a metaphor for illness and death Mm -hmm. and like him moving on to a new quote unquote world. Right. Sure. It ends with acceptance. Yeah. It's actually a very touching movie. Let me just get up the actor who played him. Grant Williams. Just a very touching performance. And they do a lot of, even more so than Shrinking Woman, they do a lot of work with oversized sets and props. And even Mm -hmm. here, you'll have the same costume where they built 10 different versions for 10 different sizes. And for a B-movie made in the 50s, they do some spectacular work matching the textures. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the bits when he's trapped in the basement and is trying to figure out how to get over a crack between shelves. Because he knows where there's some bread. He knows where there's Mm -hmm. a tiny piece of bread that's literally the only food left to him in the basement and he's having to scale furniture and cross these crevices and fight this spider and literally armed with a pin and the production design is just astonishing and not even just saying for the time it's really Mm. good production design they do a lot of great work with forced perspective and split screen and there's a few blue screen shots that are very obvious just because he doesn't have a shadow but again for the time it's effects work and design work that really actually holds up very well well and Mm. from a technical theater standpoint like getting a project like that being asked to work on something like Mm -hmm. that that's a fun that's not your usual like oh we need this palatial thing so find all these 18th century artifacts and make sure the wallpaper matches this is like it's playground time for the prop department that's exciting to work on so i wouldn't be surprised they'd put their best effort into it even if it wasn't a big budget even in like when he's down in the basement it's like all he has is a scrap of cloth and as he keeps getting smaller he has to gradually tear that scrap into other scraps and just make smaller and smaller outfits (laughs) and it's even like bits where like over the course of scaling the wall the pin that he is holding is getting larger. They don't even call Mm. attention to it, but it's like, if you look for it, you realize it's bigger than it was when he started. Mm -hmm. In the book, in the original movie, he's not shrinking in spurts. He's steadily declining. It's at a set pace. Okay. To even in the book, when the doctors figured out what's going on with him, they even gave him a chart. It's like, you have this much time to go before you're less than an inch. And we're sure you're pretty much going to be dead at that point. (laughs) Just no one can really think that, well, no, you'll just keep shrinking. You'll just go beyond the points of human measurement. As long as everything's shrinking in proportion, it shouldn't kill you. (laughs) I mean, even just the bit when he's being attacked by the cat is stunningly well done sequence because it's literally just playing with him like he's a mouse, just batting at him and knocking him around. And it's terrifying. He tries to escape to the dollhouse. Well, yeah, but the back of the dollhouse doesn't have a wall. It's just up against the wall. Mm. The cat just pushes its way in. (laughs) Yeah, like I'm looking at stills of him with the cat right now, and Mm -hmm. they're just fantastic. And some of these have got to be a puppeteered cat, too. I think there was like a larger arm that they used for some of the sets, which looks a lot better than like, Mm. say, the giant rubber hand and (laughs) Land of the Giants. But (laughs) (laughs) But no, it was the book is a bit tough to recommend just because it's so hard to get into him as a character and it's unrelatable. Sure. That said, just the whole segments of him in the basement trying to survive is just such a primal, pulpy fantasy story set in this alien familiarity of the basement of an average home. I just wish that the bits when we would flash back to his prior life were just more relatable and not just off-putting all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The movie I would highly recommend. It was rewritten in all the right ways. It's so well put together. On a technical level, it holds up incredibly well. Cool. Sorry, I just found a picture of some of the prop guys Mm -hmm. moving the set of giant scissors. Oh, the scissors are great. And giant pencils. And they chromed them too. yeah. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I might just watch the movie just for the props. Yeah, I think the movie is one of the classics of science fiction. It's this simple concept. 
you start shrinking. And it just explores it on an emotional level, on a realistic, like, how would your world start to reshape itself around you? You know, not only in terms of the people in your lives, but just physically. Uh, you know, in both of them, he has an affair with a little person at a circus. What? <laughs> it's a little odd. Are you referencing Thinner? No. Well, Thinner <laughs> is itself a version of this. Yes, it is. Except for it's only look at the horror parts of it. Right, right. And I think, again, that's kind of what the original book mm -hmm. was more like, too. I would say, yeah, Thinner is more like the book because that is an unlikable character. Oh, <laughs> yeah. well, you yeah. don't want him to get fixed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the original movie, again, it's bittersweet of this guy loses. He never gets a cure. He never mm -hmm. gets to reconnect with his wife. He never gets to have his life back. But again, it's a disease. It's like you get to the end. All you can really do is either continue being terrified of it or just accept it and see where it leads you around the next corner. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really damn good movie. So ultimately, uh, I think that wraps up our episode on The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Well, I wanted to thank you both for letting me talk about it and rewatch it and be part of, of your podcast. Of course. Thank you. You were a wonderful guest. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> You're too kind. And you want to just tell everyone where they can find you again online? Oh, sure. You can find my podcast at Real Education Noir, where I co-host with Allie and Melissa. Mm -hmm. And that comes out on the 7th and 21st of every month. And we just had our 50th episode come out. Mm. Oh, cool. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. All right, so do you have any questions about anything uh, going in or? Uh, can I swear? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good, because there will be a lot of that. <laughs> but only in softened versions that you would use in front of a five-year-old. So like Fudge or Dagnabbit. Wait, really? <laughs> no, no. No. Oh, Jesus, Noel. <laughs> <laughs>